good morning, church. This morning is our final message in our recurring series that we've done throughout the course of this year called Let's Have a Holiday, where every time the the Christian calendar marks a holiday or a significant event, we've stopped and taken pause and explored its meaning a little bit further. We experienced together the baptism of Christ, remembering our own baptisms. We examined our own mortality as we gathered together on Ash Wednesday. We celebrated the gift of resurrection on Easter Sunday and the birth of the church on Pentecost. And we joined other Christians around the world to celebrate the means of grace a month ago on World Communion Sunday. Each time, we've come with open hearts and minds asking God to speak to our souls. And today is no different. For today we celebrate one of my favorite church holidays, All Saints Day, a a day when the church celebrates the legacy and the lives of those who have gone on before us. We read the role of the victorious, we light candles, we remember, and we also look ahead. This is a day that we as a church family gather around those who grieve and honor them. But we also celebrate and remember the spiritual giants in our lives, that great cloud of witness that has surrounded us to shape and form who we are. If you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to the book of Hebrews chapter 12. Now, as a reminder, we don't know a whole lot about the book of Hebrews. We, We don't know who wrote it. We don't know if it was intended for a specific community. We do know that it received a lot of circulation within the early church, and we can reasonably assume that it was written to folks who had an understanding of the Jewish faith because it frames Christian theology under the lens of the Old Testament. This book, though little is known, speaks important truths to us as a Christian community about our faith. We're going to look at verses 1 through 2. Hear these words. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely. Let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame and has taken a seat at the right hand of God. The writer of Hebrews claims that we are surrounded by a a, a great cloud of witnesses and then calls us to run the race that is set before us. And and I'll get to the race in a moment, but I want to spend a little bit of time talking about what is meant here when the author's talking about a cloud of witnesses. The answer, scripturally, is not far from these words because the, the first two verses of chapter 12 follow a description in chapter 11. And it's there that the author tells us that the fundamental fact of existence is an ability to trust in God, that that our faith is a firm foundation under which everything in life becomes worth living for. Faith is that handle on on the stuff that we can't see. The act of faith distinguishes us and our ancestors. By faith, we see the world called into existence by God's word. We see What God has created, we also see through our faith and understand things that we don't fully comprehend. By an act of faith, Abel brought a better sacrifice to God than Cain. It was he who believed, and it wasn't necessarily what he brought that made a difference, because that's what God noticed and approved as righteous was his belief. By an act of faith, Enoch skipped death completely. This crowd of people, they looked all over for him, but he wasn't found. And before he was taken up, we, we know through testimony in Scripture that he pleased God. It's impossible to please God apart from faith, because anyone who wants to approach God must not only believe that God exists, but that God cares enough to respond to those who seek him. By faith, Noah built a ship in the middle of dry land. He was warned about something that he couldn't see, but he acted on what he was told. And the result was that his family was saved. 
His act of faith drew a sharp line between the evil of the unbelieving world and the righteousness of the believing world. And as a result, Noah had this deep and intimate relationship with God. By an act of faith, Abraham said yes to God's call to travel to an unknown place, a foreign country where he lived in tents. Isaac and Jacob did the same, living under the exact same promise. Abraham did it because he had his eye on the thing that was not yet seen. By faith, barren Sarah was able to become pregnant. She was an old woman when this happened, but because she believed in the one who had made the promise, she believed that God could do what God had said, and indeed it happened. Each of these people of faith died, not yet having in hand what was promised, but they still believed. How did they do it? Because they saw off in the distance what God had in store, and they waved their greeting to it and accepted the fact that they may not see it. They could have gone back any time they wanted, but instead they chose to go after a far better reality. By faith, Abraham at the time of testing offered Isaac back to God. Now Isaac had been promised to Abraham and, and God had said that descendants of Abraham would come through Isaac and now Isaac's being asked to, to make a sacrifice to God of his only son. But by faith, Abraham went and he believed perhaps that God could raise the dead and that's exactly what happened when God told him to take his son off of the altar. By an act of faith, Isaac reached into the future, blessing Jacob and Esau. By an act of faith, Jacob on his deathbed blessed each of Joseph's son. By an act of faith, Joseph, while dying, prophesied the exodus of Israel and made arrangements for his own burial. And by an act of faith, the parents of Moses kept their baby and their child hidden for three months, braving the king's decree. By faith, Moses, when grown, refused the privilege of the Egyptian royal house. He chose a hard life with God's people rather than an opportunistic soft life full of sin with the oppressors. He valued suffering far greater than the Egyptian wealth because he was looking ahead and anticipating the payoff. By an act of faith, he turned his heel on Egypt indifferent to the king's blind rage he had his eye on the one that no one can see and kept right on going. And by an act of faith, he kept the Passover feast, sprinkling the blood on each house in order that the destroyer of the firstborn wouldn't harm them. By an act of faith, Israel walked through the Red Sea on dry ground. The Egyptians tried it and drowned. By faith, the Israelite marched around the walls of Jericho for seven days and the walls fell flat. By an act of faith, Rahab, the Jericho harlot, welcomed the spies and escaped the destruction that came on those who refused to trust in God. The writer of Hebrews concludes in chapter 11 that they could go on and on, but they just didn't have the room, they didn't have the time. But they identify others like Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David, Samuel, the prophets, and says that through their acts of faith, they toppled kingdoms. They made justice work. They took promises for themselves. They were protected from lions and fires and sword thrusts that they turned disadvantages into advantages, that they won battles. They routed alien armies. Women received loved ones back from the dead, and there were those who under torture refused to give in and go free because they preferred God's future. Others braved abuse and whips, Chains and dungeons, we have stories of people who were stoned, sawed in half, murdered in cold blood, stories of vagrants wandering the earth in animal skins, homeless, friendless, powerless. The world didn't deserve them, but they made their way as best they could on the world's cruel edges in order to follow God. And none of these people, even though their faith was exemplary, got their hands on what God had promised them. Because God had a better plan, a bigger plan than span the time of their life, a plan that might unite their faith and, and our faith together, that we would continue to work to become a complete whole, that their faith, that their lives were not separated from our lives today. These are the people that belong in the cloud of witnesses that the writer of Hebrews is talking about. The people 
in the books of the Bible, throughout the stories of the Old and New Testaments, that gave their all to God. And despite not seeing God's fruition, or the full fruition of God's plan, they trusted in God. They knew that the work that they were doing was laying the foundation for the next generation of God's people to continue to make God's vision a reality. We learn that the pioneer of faith and of salvation is Jesus Christ who made God's vision of saving God's people a possible through his death and resurrection that we might be offered the gift of grace and the hope of heaven. The giants of faith identified in Hebrews 11 form the basis of the faith that we have today. They are Israel's cloud of witnesses. And scripture contains example after example of people who were faithful and as a result experienced reward either in this life or in the next. And these are not the only folks who have served in our cloud of witnesses. In my own life, there have been countless people that have picked up where the previous generations left off to ensure that the life of faith was passed on to me from my parents and my grandparents to my very first pastor, Reverend Richard Waddell, who just so happened in his time in ministry to serve at Batavia Faith, making Nicole's appointment there somewhat of a complete circle. Reverend Waddell married my parents. He baptized me, and he was my pastor for the first 10 years of my life. His wife, Bertha, was a Sunday school teacher to me for a number of years, and, and she taught us the stories of Jesus in ways that only childlike minds can understand. Next came Marvin Ruth Paxton. You've heard of them. The, the two of them were with me during my struggle and bout with depression, and you know the influence that they've had on the person I am today. We lost Marv in 07, and Ruth joined him in heaven this past spring. Ruth carried my stole when I was ordained, and we'd hoped that she could do the same for Nicole this summer, but we certainly, as we walked across that stage, felt their presence around us, and we're honored that they were a part of our lives. Then came Reverend Jerry Lampton, the first pastor who gave me an opportunity to step into a pulpit and preach a sermon. Through her, I began to develop this passion for preaching and ministry. And while she was my pastor, began to feel that nudge from God, that call on my life more fully. I was blessed to have Jerry stand behind me as I was ordained and she sponsored my wife this summer as well. There have been others who have stepped into my life and into my faith journey those that have encouraged me as a pastor, those that have helped me to develop as a person. And there are folks like my candidacy men, or Reverend Brian Harkness, or District Superintendents, Henry Stringer, Barb Scholas, Brian Brown, clergy colleagues like Ron Dodge, Marie Smith, Mark Putman, and Mark Rowland. They're all in my cloud of witnesses, people that have been poured into by others and have chosen to pour themselves into me. As an elder in the United Methodist Church, I share in a responsibility to the local church. But it's also expected that we serve at the district and conference level, and there's a variety of ways through which we can serve. So I chose to serve at our district and conference boards of ordained ministry so that I might pour into others that are going through the candidacy process what has been poured into me. You too have your own cloud of witnesses, your own story to share, your own journey in life that has been impacted by others. And days like today, All Saints Day, beckons us to ask ourselves a few questions. Who is in your cloud of witnesses? What have they taught you? What have they shown you? How have you seen the influence that they've had on your life playing out? in your day-to-day -day actions? And how are you sharing the influence of those within your own cloud with others? You see, each of us is a 
person of faith, as a people of faith, we share a common cloud of witnesses through the faith examples that we read about in Scripture. But there are people in our individual lives who have set the stage for us. They have built the foundation on which we stand. And they did so, self-sacrificially. Some of them never knowing how their efforts were going to come to fruition in our lives. And we're called to ask ourselves, are we going to pay that forward by laying a foundation for those who will follow us? The writer of Hebrews uses two powerful images in our text today. The first is that of a cloud of witnesses, and the second is that of a race. And they call out the fact that many have come before us, and we can assume that many will come after us. And most important today is that the cloud of witnesses of those who have gone on before us have now passed the baton on to us. The legacy that began in Genesis at the very beginning and carried throughout Scripture as the story of God's relationship with humankind continued to unfold, that baton that has been passed from generation to generation from the beginning of time now rests in our hands. What are we going to do with it? Well, it's important for us to look back and remember that we have been shaped, surrounded, molded, and formed by this great cloud of witnesses. We can't get stuck with our head in the clouds because there's work for us to do here on earth. The people that came before us did not have a desire that we would do nothing with the faith and the church that they gave to us. At Mount Moriah, we have a cloud of witnesses who made personal sacrifices throughout the years to give us what we have today. They made tough choices to leave places of familiarity and comfort because they knew that God had a bigger dream. They chose not to retire from the church because they knew that God still had work for them to do. At times, they dug deep into their pockets to provide resources that would provide a way for the future vitality of Mount Moriah. It's the legacy that they've passed on to us. We now hold the baton. It is our time. Will we continue to pursue that God-sized dream or are we going to hold on to what's comfortable and familiar and stop running the race? In 2017, Mount Moriah will celebrate 175 years of ministry to, for, and with this community. Our surroundings have changed much in the last 175 years, as have our facilities, worship styles, and the faces that we see each week. But it doesn't change the fact that we stand on a foundation 175 years in the making. And now it's our time to build upon that foundation, to grow and to provide for the generations who might stand on this foundation 175 years from now. We have been so blessed by a great cloud of witnesses. And someday someone could be celebrating what we've given to them. Or perhaps they'll be lamenting because of the choices we didn't make because we dropped the baton. I, for one, hope that we will make the decisions today that will give cause for future generations to celebrate I hope that we will take that baton, the weight that it holds, that will run the race as hard and as fast as we can until it's our turn to pass the baton on to someone else. The people who have shaped our faith are part of a larger cloud of witnesses that goes all the way back to the beginning of time. God has called people throughout the ages to bear witness to God's love. Each of us has been surrounded by an incredible and great cloud of witnesses, and each of us is called to pick up their mantle and to continue running the race because it's the greatest honor that we could give to those who have impacted our lives, that we might carry their legacy forward, paving the way for future generations to receive and experience the transforming power of the grace of God. Our cloud of witnesses goes behind us May we not get stuck with our head in the clouds, but rather honor what we have been given by advancing our mission, running our race, and building upon this foundation 
to ensure that we bring God's vision one step closer to completion. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our cloud of witnesses. We thank you for the work and for the effort that they have put in to get us to this point. We celebrate their lives and their legacies this day, and we are humbled by the fact that it is now our race to run, that the baton rests in our hands. We pray that you would lead us and guide us, O oh God, that we might take the next faithful steps to ensure a bright future for those who will come after us. This we pray in the name of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My friend, we go this day surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses who are rooting us and cheering us on, running behind us as we pick up the baton and run our race forward. And we go knowing that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are with us now and with us always. We'll see you in a few weeks.